pull these things after um, everybody else you've heard from today. I'm Katie O'Neill. I'm an infectious disease physician and, um, as Kevin said, the chief medical advisor for the Southeastern Conference. I wanted to give you just a little bit of an update today on what our medical teams have been up to over the last year. Last year when we spoke, we talked about um, this is a new program for the conference, really trying to get our medical teams together and to set some common goals. So last year when we, we met at this time, we spoke about our goals were really to put out a mental health survey. We needed to find out what our student athletes expected of us from a mental health standpoint. And we'll talk a little bit about launching that survey in a second. We were also expanding our medical time out. As you can imagine, we're still reeling from the DeMar Hamlin incident, as well as um, several other incidences in college and professional sports in which we've seen sudden cardiac death on the field of play or at practice. And so how do we make sure that we are performing those medical timeouts and practicing them so that we can be ready? We talked a little bit about our student athlete leadership conferences. So we have several throughout the year where we take our student athletes and we talk about a variety of issues. We get their feedback, but we also try to teach them a little bit about how to become more engaged as student athletes. And last year, we spent a lot of time talking about how to be an engaged patient in medical decision making. And lastly, again, we're just trying to get all of our healthcare professionals across our was 14 schools, now 16 schools to collaborate on best practices amongst the SEC. When we looked at um, surveying our student athletes about mental health, because we do believe that mental health is the number one priority of our healthcare specialties right now, uh, we wanted to get a couple of things from them. This survey was not about their mental health, it was about the mental health of their team. What was their perception of the mental health of their team? What was their perception of the resources that their schools have for them to access? We also wanted to talk about whether or not they thought mental health was as important as we thought it was, because we wanted to track with them in their goals for their teams um, throughout the year. So we launched our survey. It was about a 10 to 13 minute survey, depending on how much input you put into it. We used our student athlete leadership groups to test the survey first, and then we sent it out to all of our student athletes last September and gave them about a month to answer the survey. Some of the lessons we learned from their responses. First, we learned that overall, our student athletes feel really positive about the current state of mental health of their teams. And in each question, we asked them to assess the mental health of the group that they work with the most and play with the most. Um, we also learned that athletes are aware of the resources that they have. We really wanted to make sure coming off of the NCAA's mental health survey that athletes knew about the resources that our campuses have to offer them. And they said overwhelmingly that they did. They were aware of that they had resources to, that were offered to them. We asked them too in this digital age, how do you want to receive information about mental health? Because what we saw in the NCAA survey is that there was a gap of student athletes who just did not know how to access mental health resources. So we asked student athletes specifically, how do you want to be contacted about the availability of mental health on your campus? And overwhelmingly, they said in person which was a learning lesson for us because we spend a lot of time on social media. We spend a lot of time directly messaging through apps to our student athletes because they are a digital group. But when they talk about healthcare issues and especially mental health, they want it to be a personal conversation and the people they most trusted were their athletic trainers and their healthcare professionals in school. So that was something really good that we could feed back to our schools to say, you can continue to push the messaging boards and you can continue to push your online content, but what they really want is a personal conversation in the training room. And so we, uh, we talked about that this year in our medical um, meeting in May and how do we reach the athlete where they wanna be reached. And then lastly, we really focused on that mental health day. So we had heard athletes talking about what a mental health day is to them. They put a lot of content into the survey on um, how to establish a mental health day and what they wanted to see from that. And we were able to give that feedback to our mental health professionals to spend the next year looking at policies across the conference. So what are our goals going into 24-25? One of our biggest goals is just, again, to make sure that that medical timeout is as robust as possible. When a cardiac event occurs in front of you, and you should always be ready for one, whenever you have a large group in front of you, you have two minutes before you lose brain function. Two minutes to find an ambulance, to find an AED, to find the team who's ready to resuscitate a patient and to get them ready to resuscitate. That's not a lot of time. A football field is very far. The place to get to an AED if you don't know where it is on a basketball court is very far. 
So we are spending a lot of time prepping our teams before we go to any event, whether it be a championship or just an SEC matchup, to make sure that they are ready to handle an emergency. Our student athlete leadership group gave us a lot of feedback about medical decision making. They want to be more engaged. They want to play to their fullest potential and they get a lot of medical information that is not necessarily trustworthy. And so how do they parse through that and how do they ask the right questions as a, um, as a patient? This Friday we'll have another group of student athletes here and, um, and we'll talk about how to seek reliable medical information with them and get their engagement on how do you tell between an online post, a medical professional in front of you but maybe not somebody who is engaged in your health care, and then somebody on your team. The last thing we'll do this year is we're going to work towards developing a conference-wide electronic medical record system. One of, our, one of the biggest takeaways from our healthcare professionals is that athletes are moving a lot amongst our teams. And if you move from A&M to Oklahoma to Florida in your career, how do we make sure that that critical medical information follows you each way that you go? Faxes don't work, word of mouth doesn't work, paper notes don't work. And so moving towards a conference-wide electronic medical record system allows the athlete to move and seamlessly connect their, their healthcare, which is something that they desire. We're going back and looking at shared goals and initiatives amongst the conference. There are some easy wins that we can do if we put all 16 schools on the same train to get there. And our medical professionals are working towards several different um, initiatives this year. And then lastly, we need to develop some protocols that actually take a look at our injury rate and then develop protocols that um, we can see in the next couple of years reduce injuries. A key component of that is going to be to have that electronic medical record system so that we can track our data more reliably and we'll be working towards that over the next couple of years. That is my last slide. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Neal. If you have a question for Dr. Neal, raise your hand. We've got some microphones. Uh, we can bring them to you if you've uh, got a question about a presentation or other questions related to medical issues in the SEC. Uh, we have one over here on the right over here, Adley. Right here to our left, right there. Hey, Catherine. Uh, Scott Ravelay from the Baton Rouge Advocate. Hey, Scott. This will pertain to a lot of teams, but with the expanded playoff, the, the prospect exists that you could have a team from this conference playing, or teams playing 16 or 17 games. What are you guys looking at in far, as far as that goes with, with the possibility teams can be playing more football games than ever? With every practice and every game that you're going to play, you have the potential for more injuries. It's an easy math equation, right? And so our teams are already starting to think about what is that rehab process and how do we work through what could be a longer season for some teams, hopefully for many of our teams. Um, I think that when we talk about uh, safety and return to play, that becomes even more important. And our student athletes feel that. If I make the best decision in an early October injury for myself, I may play in the college football playoff. If I rush my return to just get to the next game, then I may put myself out at the end of December. And so that's why we're really focusing on educating the student athletes about those critical decisions because we have a long season for them to get through and another season hopefully, but also our medical teams. And, and a lot of that, Scott, is gonna come, not this year, but through our data gathering of this year and next year and taking a look at the impact that a longer season has on our athletes. Dr. O'Neill, we're going to go all the way to the back, uh, yep. right in front of the black curtain <laughs> area. Hi, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you for coming today. Bo Carter with Sports Page Dallas and Texas Sports Weekly. Can you talk a little bit? You were talking about swapping information among the schools. Have you come up with an idea maybe for a consortium of the great med schools, Vanderbilt, LSU, Florida, and all those maybe that can be working with you on different things? And also, should I go get my next COVID booster shot? <laughs> Thanks, Bo. Uh, second question first. Uh, it's not time for your COVID booster yet or your flu shot. Um, and if you're of the age of your RSV vaccine, but all of those things will be coming out in their latest available um, booster in the next month or two. So look out for those signs on your pharmacies locally. Um, and we do expect to have a very busy viral season again this fall. One of the things that keeps our athletes out of the game besides injuries. Um, we have to harness the power of the SEC. We are not just 16 phenomenal athletic teams, right? We are 16 absolutely phenomenal universities and our medical schools partner 
all of the time on lots of very interesting data sets. And so we are gonna use that talent to be able to, to look at our injury rates and to be able to look at our just our health issues, problems, and feed that back to our student athletes to keep them healthier. Hey, we're gonna stay in that same section, but about three quarters of the way back in the middle. Uh, Chris Vanini from The Athletic. I don't know if this is totally in your scope, but when you talk about mental health and dealing with players and that, have you seen an increase uh, and mental health issues from players regarding sports gambling and the pressures being put on them? In all of the feedback that we've heard about mental health, sports gambling has not come up from the student athletes nor from our surveys as a significant portion of their stress of mental health. Our student athletes talk a lot about dealing with social media in general and how to cope with the onslaught of feedback that they get. But as most healthcare professionals know, the trickle down effect of anything that's new and upcoming is usually several years in the making before we start to see the, the um, end effects of those things. And so we're keeping our eyes on all of the pressures that they're facing, especially in these, this last critical year and how that's gonna affect our mental health of our student athletes going forward. Okay, we'll go right in front of us here to the right, Dr. O'Neill, right to the front Do right. Dr. O'Neill, Terry Middleton with Horns Illustrated. Terry. This is gonna be a big question, but okay. curious if you are looking at or trying to mitigate the influence of fentanyl to players, athletes. I know it's a big monster issue across our society, but as it pertains to the players. Um, when we look at player use, of any illicit substance. Um, it all starts with education and every player who enters an athletic department gets baseline education on the use of illicit substances. What many of our athletic departments also do is then offer um, additional education throughout the year talking about the impact of any illicit use on performance. Because what we know is that the student athlete has told us the thing that affects me most from a mental health perspective is the load that I have to put on me every day and how I perform. And so if we want them to in any way make advances in their daily health, it's gonna be through improving performance. And so our teams have really come at it from an education on illicit substances and how we can improve your performance and trying to make that link so that our student athletes feel less pressure to, um, to partake in any, any substances. We have not seen fentanyl alone be a big part of the concerns that our student athletes have. Okay, we'll go straight in front of free me, about three rows of Jenny. Dr. O'Neill, Jenny Carlson with Beyond the Box Score. The last couple years, there have been a couple high-profile female athletes who've committed suicide. I'm wondering, as you look at mental health with our women's athletes, if there are issues specific to them. We've seen the increase of attention and, and um, pressure on some of the uh, female athletes in their sports and just the high-profileness. High are there any common threads there as it relates to women and athletes? Athletics. There are, so our, our female student athletes spoke more about time management as a stress than our male student athletes spoke about in the, in the um, mental health survey and really talked about, um, we asked questions about what resources could we offer to you and overwhelmingly where there was a larger desire in our female student athletes to get resources that help them cope with time management skills. So I think that there are some differences amongst our male and female athletes and we were able to give that feedback to our teams and our academic advisors. So the whole department able to get this feedback and say, what can I do to just help to cope with the day-to-day -day stress that ultimately builds up into a mental health issue, but we would like to tackle it where it begins, which is really coping with a, a new school, a new place, a new schedule, um, and new expectations of themselves to perform. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. I know if you have other questions, she'll be available, but we'd like to thank her for her time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you.